Facebook and all of our media family. Come on in, come on down. That's just so amazing. Time is just going by so it's not going forever. So it's just been an amazing book before. We you can call me later. <laughs> anyway, so okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to finish. I'm sure you all know, and I want to make sure that you do know, um, that Mark Jackson was promoted to heaven last week. Oh, yeah. I know. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just really um, He was our minister of music for a few years when we, in our very beginning days, and um, such a blessing to us in those days. Uh, I, I think about one of the highlights, and there are so many, but one of the highlights um, was he coordinated all of the worship that surrounded it when we brought the life-size tabernacle in, and he had every night a different worship singer that was there, and it was it was just uh, heaven on earth during that week. It really was, and he was very instrumental in the atmosphere of worship that was provided during that time. It was just amazing, and not just us, he's been a blessing to many in the body of Christ. So, um, I hear that his service is going to be next Saturday, the 14th of um, the month. Um, it won't be next Saturday, so it's two weeks. So 14th is what I'm hearing. Um, and it's going to be at World Harvest Christian Center. So I will post on Facebook um, and let you know if you have any questions, see me. But yeah, real. Real heaven's gain, um, but a real loss. Yes. Like Amen. Mm -hmm. Was just shocked. Was really shocked. Fifty-eight years old, and mm -hmm. I know one thing: heaven has a whole new sound. Yeah. Yeah. It has before. Yes. Heaven has a whole new sound. Um, the day he landed, to keep Margaret and her family in prayers. I know they're, I know they're hurting. Let's just pray for them. Father, we come into your presence. And I, I'm so thankful. We are so thankful that what we know of each other in this realm is just nothing in comparison to eternity. Yet we put so much into the here and now, Lord, and what is to come is the best. The best truly is yet to come. And I just thank you for the opportunity to have co-labored in your world's vineyard, Lord, with with Minister Mark and, yes. and his sister and his wife and their family and such such great memory, great joyful days, Lord. And um, I just thank you again that we know where Mark is. And truly, I do believe that the day he entered heaven's gates, there was a new sound that was proclaimed in heaven. I just can see him skipping, running, jumping <laughs> down the very gold streets of heaven with an entourage of others just following him. But until we get to join that parade, God, and that worship team, um, I pray for Margaret. We pray for Margaret. We pray for their children and extended family and all of the body of Christ that, that Mark so tangibly touched God. Uh, we pray for comfort and strength and um, Lord, I, I think about the words of King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes when he said that it's a, it's a wise man that, that spends time in a house in mourning because the living will take hold of it in their heart. Lord, we just thank you that you promised us long life. Um, and we also look at around at each other and we don't know what tomorrow holds and when will be the last time we may see each other. So help us to take eternity in our hearts today and make every minute count. Let's put aside the things that really don't matter at all in comparison to eternal life and the family that will be with the eternal life. May we ask for strength, for comfort, and a peace that passes understanding in Jesus' precious name. And all yes. God's people Amen. said, Amen. 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 Okay. Well, we left off at chapter 13, verse 7 last week. Um, those first seven verses were, again, packed with drama. I mean, this book has just been so amazing. Um, as Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem a second time, he finds the revival fires that were once present when he left Jerusalem as he went back to Babylon, um, serving still under King Artaxerxes, that those revival fires had dwindled 
to nothing more than some warm embers, maybe a few sparks. Um, why? Because they had interfaced with the world and the world was moving into their lives once again. You think to yourself, and you might say like I did, really, again? But that, that, that's why it's so important for us to, to be together and to gather a couple times a week and to get fueled up and to get charged up and to get that, that IV shot, if you will, of just infusion of the presence of God. Because left to ourselves in isolation and alone, we tend to drift not towards God. The flesh tends to drift towards the things of the world. So I think that's one of the big lessons that are such a huge takeaway as we've studied this book together. See, that's how it works in revivals, too. We talked about that, the intermarrying of the, uh, uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites and their friendship with the world. We saw Elisha, the, the high priest, he removed, I, we, I was stunned at this, removed the sacred tithes and offerings from the people's giving out of the temple and the servants the volunteers, if you will, they were more than volunteers, but they were servants who attended to these things. Elisha did this to provide room. Can you, can you still take this in? He did it to provide room for Tobiah. Well, wait a minute, Pastor Judge, three, four, five chapters ago, he decided he was the enemy. Yeah. Well, here's, here's the authority of the temple making room for the enemy to come right on in. Well, we spent some time this week talking about that. Have we made room for Tobiah? Mm -hmm. And what do we do that makes that room? Compromise. Mm -hmm. Compromise. I have a little drop here, a little something there. You know, it's no big deal. You can get straight again on Monday. No. These compromise. Satan's very patient. Mm -hmm. He's very patient. A lot more patient than us sometimes. Mm -hmm. To just allow us one little compromise at a time, one little decision at a time. To the next thing you know, we're on the wide road leading to mass destruction in our spiritual lives. And this was what was going on. And again, I can't emphasize enough because this think it's such a picture and relatable to us. Is that we, they've already opened the scrolls. They've already opened the book and recommitted and rededicated. You remember, we've studied that together. Well, here we are again. Here we are again, the last chapter, and here they are again, going back down the same old wide path leading to destruction. Only this time, we have the church leaders opening the door to the enemies. Why did he do that? Compromise. We decided last week it was because the priest's daughter married Tobiah's son. This intermarriage took place. And see, that's the beginning of, well, you know, make room for this and, and be tolerant of something else and make an exception over here. You know, just slam the door on every aspect of God's word and then we won't have to worry about scraping up all our compromises along the way, amen? It always starts out as something that just seems like, oh, it'll work out. We've talked a couple times through this book. There is no such thing as missionary dating. Yeah, you date for a mate. Yeah. The end of the story. If he's not saved, if she's not saved, he's not or she's not for you. It's just that simple. Then you don't have to worry about your children aren't allowed to go to vacation or Bible school. Your children aren't allowed to go to church. Because you never opened the door, and I never opened the door. We never opened the door to begin with. Amen? Amen. And this falls into so many other categories. Because sin will take us a place we never knew, never expected, never thought, never dreamed it would take us. And it just starts out with a little something. Just a little something. And here, the priest. He made this exception because his daughter married Tobiah's son. Mm. So after all, we're family. So why not compromise God's word mm. to let this unbeliever take hold? Mm. And he evacuated the room in the house of God where there were servants that were godly people serving. And they had to go back to farming because there was no room for them anymore in the oh, house of God. We asked ourselves, have I, have you, have we? Be mindful about making room for the Tobias in that come into our life. Because let me tell you, Satan desires to introduce you to Tobias. Mm. 
he very much desires. So we've got to be prepared for that, don't we? We've got to be prepared for when those things happen. Now, Nehemiah, a type of Holy Spirit we talked about a long time ago, really spoke to us about also this week, how God reverses curses. We spent most of our time last week talking about the blessing of Abraham that is upon us versus the curse of the law. Sadly, many, 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 I, I'm going to stretch and say most, I, I believe in my experience, saying most is the correct thing to say, Christians live under the law. Yes. They may not live under the law in, in, in the thought process of you know doing things to be good before God, but they live under the law in the punishment end of things. Mm -hmm. They don't see God as good. They don't yeah. see that God became, Jesus became the curse. Mm -hmm. He became your curse. He became every single thing that the law would want to put upon us in our disobedience, in all of that. He became that. Hallelujah. So that what? So that all that's left in a blood-bought, new covenant, Abrahamic, entered into the Jewish covenant believer's life, is the blessing. The blessing. Amen. Stop. We, we, we need to stop looking. Yes, we're going to do things wrong. You get it right with the Lord and you move on. God's not up there waiting for us to do something wrong with his anvil. There they are again. Because he became all that. I, I'll tell you, if, if we never talked about another thing till Jesus came, we could spend the rest of the time till Jesus came. Contemplating, meditating, understanding, and just just bringing that into transformational place in our life, that there is no curse on a Christian. That's right. Because Jesus became the curse. Amen. He became the curse so that we could have the blessing. Yes. All you got to do is turn over to Deuteronomy 28, and you'll know right away where your mind as a new covenant believer has been. We're supposed to stay to the blessing side. And if you see something come on the curse side, you just need to say, that's not for me. Amen. My Savior took that. Amen. That's right. Amen. Different way of thinking. Very different way of thinking. But we have to think that way because as a man thinks, so is he. Right? Yep. So our thinking totally matters in what we're believing in going on. So we talked this week in great sense about God reversing those curses. So what does Nehemiah do? as he returns to find all this. What does he do? I mean, he comes back after being back in Babylon. We don't know how long he was there. Some commentators think a couple years. Some think, and I'll show you today, that it was actually enough time that people had children. So a really long time. But sooner or later, he finds out, and he goes back to Jerusalem, and he finds what we talked about last week, and he does what I'm going to call a little spring cleaning. Let's see, verses 7 through 9. And I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Elisha had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. Who? Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. <laughs> then I commanded them to cleanse the room. And I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. He takes Tobiah's suitcase and throws it out the window and gives them the gift of goodbye. <laughs> it's really not that hard to do. It's a decision. Yes. It's simply just, wait, well, I can't, I'm not going to hurt somebody's feelings. And, oh, and, you know, and she, this is just going to be so hard, and I'm going to cry, and I'm going to feel so bad. And Nehemiah didn't get all hung up in his feelings. Yeah. What laid before him is life and death, and he chose life. Yes. And he did what he had to do to walk in the paths of life that lead to what? Prosperity and righteousness and joy and all those things we've been talking about all through this book. That's not all. He didn't just throw them out. He fumigated the place. <laughs> some you need to do some fumigation around your house. Well, maybe you know somebody who needs to do that, right? He fumigated and he restored all of those articles that this high priest had taken out. But that's not all of your story. Verses 10 through 13. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. 
remember I mentioned, they, they weren't being supported in Jerusalem, so they went back to farming, okay? So I contended with the rulers, the leaders there, and said, why is the house of God forsaken? I love this guy. He just gets right to the core of it. And I gathered them together, and I set them in their place. Then all of Judah brought the tithe, the grain, and the new wine, and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse, Shomiah, the priest of Zadok, the scribe, and of the Levites. Pedaniah, the next to him, was Hananin, the son of so forth and so on. And they were considered faithful, and their task was to distribute to their brethren. So he brings the Levites. Remember, the Levites didn't have any portion of land. Remember that, right? They were the minister, and they, they ministered to God. They never had any portion that was given to the 12 tribes. So he brings them back. He takes them out of the fields where they were farming, casts it out because God's leader allowed sin or allowed the enemy in the camp. Mm, I could go somewhere with that. And the house of God was placed back in decency and in order. Amen. And the people began supporting once again the work of the Lord. And then Nehemiah says this in verse 13. And I appointed treasurers over that storehouse. And then we went through all the names where they were considered faithful. Faithful. You know, I, I find it so interesting that I noticed through this 13 chapters of the book of Nehemiah, he surrounds, he's dealing with problems. He, he certainly, as a leader, is going to deal with troubleshooting things and dilemmas that are going to take forth. But you know what? He surrounds himself, his support system are faithful God followers. That's what they are. And, and I wonder where you find yourself today in that, that place. I mean, you know, because we talked last week a lot about having fellowship with the world. Because Jesus said, if you have fellowship with the world, then you have enmity with me. Because what does light have to do with darkness? What does darkness have to do with light? So what are we learning here? We're learning that, yes, we're supposed to believe it or not, because I see Christians do one thing or the other. Either they're very carnal, and they may come to church, or they may whatever, but they... Their, their social life is worldly. Mm -hmm. Carnality, the word comes from carnivorous, means flesh, right? Fleshy. Or we have the exact opposite that takes place. Once we get saved, we never want to be even go around an unbeliever again. We can't go to baseball games, we can't go to Little League, oh, we just have to hang out at the church. Mm -hmm. See, that's not right either. Because we're supposed to come here to be, as you know, fueled up and gassed up and equipped to get out with unbelievers, to be a witness and to be a vessel to bring them into the kingdom. Amen? But Nehemiah and we also, his, his support, his close friends, those that he does life with, they're God chasers. How can we do life with someone that's not a God chaser? That's why we can't marry someone who's not a God chaser, who's saved. Why? Because it's going to be nothing but division. It'll just be division the whole time in the marriage. Yes. And you might think again, well, you know, he's going to get saved or she's going to get saved. Well, I know a lot of people that just didn't happen with. Mm -hmm. And their children pay the price for it, yeah. right? Because what happens? Mommy wants to take Joey to, or Daddy wants to take Joey to vacation Bible school, and Mommy doesn't want him to do that. And then we get in conversations about, well, you know, uh, Daddy, I went to vacation Bible school, and the teacher said that, you know, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, then you're going to go to hell. Does, does Mommy have Jesus in her heart? <coughs> well, no, honey, he doesn't. Does that mean he's going to hell? I mean, these are the kind of things you get into. See, if we just don't open that door to those things, and I'm using that as an example because obviously it's here to be used in this narrative, but there's so many other things that we can compromise with. There really is. The Bible says, do not even present yourself with the appearance of evil. Mm -hmm. Even the appearance of it. Mm -hmm. Amen? So he calls all of them back, and he puts them back, and he puts faithful people that are there that he can trust. Amen? Verse, verse what? We did verse 13, didn't we? So let's mm -hmm. go to... Oh, he'll say three times. He's going to say three times in the scripture about remember me, Lord. 
He will over and over and over say that as he distributes that. So Nehemiah asked God to recount what he has done. He didn't ask for a personal reward. You know, three times we're going to see before we're done this last part of this chapter, remember me, Lord. Mm -hmm. Remember me, Lord. Is that verse 14, much? Yeah. Remember me. And he's not saying that again because he wants credit for what has happened here. You know, he's asking that the Lord would fortify the changes that Nehemiah puts into place. Remember me, O oh God, concerning this. And do not wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God for its services. Again, you could read that and think, oh, he just must think he's just really something. But no, that's not what he's saying. He wants God to take this, 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 this laying out that has been transformed and changed and for God to fortify in the people's hearts that it would stay that way. Amen? Now, verses 15 through 18, which I'm not going to read, just know that it's in there as an address, tell us that they were also, not only were they intermarrying again, but there's something else they were doing. They were not honor honoring the Sabbath, okay? They weren't honoring a day of rest, okay? Now, remember what Jesus said about the Sabbath, right? Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, and you might think, well, you know, I don't really need to, I'm going to tune out on this because, you know, we're, we don't, we won't, we don't honor that. You need to have a Sabbath day of rest. Yes. It may not be sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, but you need one. Why? Because the Sabbath was made for man. Because we can only go so long, so far, so strong before this tent breaks down. Amen. Right? Yeah. I mean, it might look all that great badge to where to say I'm busy, busy, busy. But, you know, that pays its consequences. We need a Sabbath day of rest. And they were not honoring that along with the inner marriage they were taking place. What is the Sabbath? Taking once day, one day out of seven to just chill. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right? We're not doing work. Not just that. The law told them that they were to take one year out of seven years and let the ground rest. Even creation had to rest. And then there were two years every 50th year, the year of Jubilee, that they were supposed to rest, okay? He says this in verse 18. Let's see how he, he words this. Did not your fathers do this? Again, not honoring the Sabbath. And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on the city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. In fact, what is interesting to know, and maybe some of you know, and some of you maybe not know, but the fact that they are in Babylon to begin with was because they didn't honor the Sabbath. Now, there were some other things too, disobedience and whatnot, but Jeremiah tells us specifically that they were in Babylon 70 years. It was instituted for them to go, according to Jeremiah, um, because they didn't honor the Sabbath. They didn't let that ground rest, okay? And it wasn't just there, the Sabbath, for refreshment. I, take this to your own spiritual life. It wasn't there just for a time of refreshment. You know what else it was there? And it's probably even more important, is that they were forced to have to trust God. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, Pastor Beth? Well, you know, you don't have to go strong, long, and hard seven days a week. How about we just trust God for the one? Mm -hmm. See, so many people don't do that. They, they, it, it, they, they want to get ahead. But really, you just get behind. Mm -hmm. Because your physical body, the temple of God, gets broken down, right? And weary, and sickness can come through that stress and all those things that take place that way. So it's not just for refreshment to take this day. It's also to take trust moments to know that he's your provider. In fact, Exodus 31, where this is written, says that this will be a sign between me and thee. Well, why would it be a sign? Because it's a trust issue. It's a trust issue to take that time and trust him. I don't know about you. I don't know if you give any second thought to it. But I think it's quite profound. I think it's quite inspirational. 
that even in today's day and age, um, maybe there's others, I think of two right at the top of my head, that are not open on Sunday. Chick-fil-A. You better get your Happy Meal Saturday. Get two. Like, you know, to put the manna out. You know, you had to double up on that one day, right? Get two, because you're not going to find them open on Sunday. They have honored that. Is that some kind of law thing? Yeah, but I think it's honorable. Yeah. I think there's an honor there, and I think as we look at this today, we can look at a trust factor in it. Who's the other one that's not open on Sunday? Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby. So get two chicken sandwiches and make sure you get all your crabs that you need on Saturday to do that. That's honorable. I mean, it's just such a foreign to us today because somewhere along, and I remember that as a little girl, I'm sure many of you do too. Most businesses were closed on Sunday. This was an across the board thing in America. You just, you, you hung out with your church friends and you had dinners and just hung out and talked and people yep. visited and I mean we just we gotta keep ahead of the oral and everything buck nail, right? Like you can't just settle down and stop for any time whatsoever. Again, in the book of Jeremiah, God told the people he would exile them in the land for 70 years. Why? Because this was the amount of time the Sabbath rest was disobeyed. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Jeremiah prophesied 49 years. 490 years. Why? Because every seven years they were supposed to let the ground rest. You tell me, what is 490 divided by seven? 70. 70. There it is. That's exactly why that took place. Verse 19. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be opened until after the Sabbath. Then I posted some of my servants at the gate so that no burdens would be brought in on into on the Sabbath day. He puts the Lord first. And I'm sure he wasn't very popular in town that day. You, you have to put yourself in this place. See, all the marketers are out there. If you've been to Israel with us, you know when we go into the old city of Jerusalem, it's divided into four quarters. The sections have, it's a marketplace. All four of these different sections that you go into. And they'll chase you down the street. I, I make sure they chase me down the street. I'm getting the lowest price I can get off those hours. So anyway, it's amazing. Because it's like they just... But because it's in Jerusalem and the Jews' Sabbath come down, things start shutting down very early. Even those Arab sections, they, they know they're not going to really prosper there. And so this is what's happening here. There were marketers. This had been going on, we'll see, possibly through a generation. And there were marketers selling and trading and buying and doing all these things on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah just comes in and just, boom, he just shuts the gates, locks the doors. Nobody's coming in and nobody's doing anything whatsoever. You need to know those people were hot mad at him. Because it was getting into their wallet. And how many knows when something touches a man's wallet, it touches its heart, right? Because that's why Jesus said where your treasure is, is where your heart will be. Absolutely. So he wasn't popular or appreciated. But let's continue to read verse 20 through 22. Now the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of, and wares lodged outside of Jerusalem once or twice. What that means is two Sabbaths. They went to see if he shut them down twice. Then I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? And you do so again. I will lay hands on you. And I don't think he was going to pray for them. <laughs> From that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates, sanctify the Sabbath day. Second time he said, remember me. Oh God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the goodness of your great mercy, it says here. So, again, three times, Nehemiah is going to ask for this over and over and over again to, to, to remember him. Because he's so desperate for the people to be brought back in good standing with the Lord. That the Lord would be their priority. Not, not God and something else. But God and God alone. Yes. See, again, in, in, in our, our vernacular, in the New Covenant world, 
we, we look at that as, as Matthew 6.33. To seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things Amen. will follow you. Amen. See, if you touch Amen. heaven, you get earth with it. Amen. Amen. But if you Amen. just touch earth, you ain't going to get heaven. Because oh. yes. he's not of this world. That's right. It's just so simple. It's no wonder Jesus said how easy his yoke is. Just make him first. Oh. Just make whatever we do based on the word. I'm telling you, you, you the blessing will chase you down. Amen. It will chase you down. And so I just admire him so, so very much as he is, again, fortifying, asking the Lord to fortify the hearts of the people. I admire him. He stands for truth. He stands for what's right, even against his own popularity. Mm. Even against, you know, he's not the big shot anymore. See, when he was building the wall, hey, Nehemiah, woohoo, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not so much anymore. Because people have a way when they don't get what they want. Mm -hmm. You're not high on the list anymore. That's right. Everything's good for getting our own way, right? Uh, yeah. Well, they weren't getting their own way here whatsoever. He was not Mr. Popularity whatsoever. Mm -hmm. He was just a standard and a standard for righteousness, whatever it cost him personally. See, sometimes I think that's what separates the boys from the men, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we'll stand up for Jesus, but, oh, how about if it's going to cost us something? How about if we gotta do without something, or 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 whether it's the tithe, or whether it's the our time? Yeah, time. Hey, time is a very that's a commodity. Time is currency. You don't get time back. You can get more money, but you don't get more time back. Amen. What we spend our time on really has a lot to do with what our priorities are, doesn't it? I, I just I wonder as we're here today. What are, what are we spending our time on? Mm. What has our greatest attention? If we were to calculate our day and keep track hour by hour, what, what is it that, that, that has mm. most of our, of our time currency? Mm. It'll say something about mm. what's most important in our lives as we do that. Mm. And then once again in verses 23 and 24, he brings into the light, again, the intermarrying of God's people with women heathens, false God worshipers. And what does he say to do? Are you ready? Look at this, verse 25, as they are entering into this. So I contended with them, I cursed them, struck some of them, and pulled out their hair. Oh. <laughs> you know, I just oh. <laughs> I said, Woo! That's just like, Lord. Did you really write that? And made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons. You know what? We'll come back to the poll in here in a minute, but I hope what you're seeing what I'm seeing. The man is like beside himself to keep the, the, the purity of, 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 of the God type in the camp. Are we, are we that, is that that important to us? Again, please, you know, listening on Facebook, tapes will go out, whatever. I am by no means saying, in fact, I'm saying the opposite. We need to be a clan and a tribe together that build one another up, yeah. that equip one another, empower one another for the purpose of going out to the heathen, but not to have close relationships with them, not to marry within that, not to, not even close enough that you take counsel. Because Psalm 1 says, what, what does a, don't take counsel with the ungodly. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. How can they counsel you on godly things when they themselves don't even know God? Amen. 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 And you know, it's, it, it happens so easy. Mm -hmm. Because you can really like somebody. Yeah. Yes. Anybody? Amen. Listen, because somebody doesn't know Jesus doesn't mean you're bad. There are so many unsaved people I think the world of. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you something right now. It's taking the grace of God not to say more than I should say right now. But I mean, I, I'm to the point like Christians. Please don't do any work on my house anymore. Please let me have let me have someone who doesn't know Jesus because they don't do the job right. Okay. And then they don't show back up when they don't do it right. It's it's so upsetting to me. It's so upsetting to me. 
Because we're supposed to be good to one another. And the Bible says, especially to those in the household. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying that you do a shoddy job for an unbeliever. It's a matter of integrity. Yes. We had landscaping done. I'll keep the name out. We had landscaping done. And there's a problem. Mm -hmm. We have water overspouting our second floor downspout because something's not happening on how it was supposed to be drained yet. I cannot get this Christian, this is what he posed himself as to get the job, to even call me back. This is atrocious. We, we can't be known like that. No. We can't be known like that. Why, why, why am I going here? I have no idea. Did I want to pull his hair out? Maybe that's why. <laughs> that's what it was. Now I remember. <laughs> so, what are you talking about? He's so... He's so passionate about keeping that tribal connectability pure. Listen, folks, we're going to spend all eternity together. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we're sorry to disappoint you today. You know, but maybe Jesus will let you pick the house you can spend. Apparently, it won't be anybody in this church. But <laughs> Goodness gracious. You just have to live with these things. Facebook, you miss a lot. Of my anyway, again, I, I, I'll tell you, teach us to your children, teach us to your grandchildren. I don't care how lonely you are, the exchange of marrying someone who doesn't is not safe. It's it's not it's not worth the exchange. It'll bring you down. It will bring you down. But let's head up a little bit and look at this. This curse and struck them and pulled out their hair. I thought, ooh, look at Lord. This, he's pretty radical about his righteousness, isn't he? Can you even imagine? Can you imagine leaving church today and saying, oh, the message was something. I got beat up by the pastor. Pulled my hair out. Aren't you glad you're a new covenant believer? That you have to do statements or whatever? Then there, there's just there's always got to be reformation out of revival. But let's talk about this. This pulling out of here, I couldn't help but remember that Ezra, he he pulled his own hair out. Earlier in the book of Ezra, you read that, and I thought to myself, Well, well, maybe Nehemiah heard about what Ezra did and it didn't change the people. So he thought, well, let me try to pull her hair out. Maybe that'll work better. Maybe he was bald. Who knows what the reason was. <laughs> yeah. But the point of the matter is, is that we go from this meek Moses type leader and we see a passion here. Now, I don't want you to see when it says here that, that he cursed them. He wasn't using bad language. It wasn't that kind of curse. I believe what it means is he was reminding them of the curse of the law. The curse of the law that would come upon them for being disobedient to the Lord. But, but, but again, before we leave this, I can't emphasize enough the importance of marriage and being on the same page. Right? It reminded me of a story. <laughs> During the wedding rehearsal, the groom approached the victor and in an un with an unusual offer. Look, I'll give you $100 if you change the wedding veils. When you get to me and the part where I have to promise to love, honor, obey, forsake all others, and be faithful to her forevermore, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave out that entire part. He, he passed the clergyman the cash and walked away satisfied. It's now the day of the wedding. And the bride and the groom have moved to the part of the ceremony where the veils are exchanged. When it comes time for the groom's veils, the priest looks at the young man in his eyes and says, Will you promise to prostrate yourself before her, obey her every command and wish, serve her breakfast in bed every morning of your life, and swear eternally before God and your lovely wife that you will never even look at another woman as long as you both show up? <laughs> the groom gulped and looked around and said in a tiny voice, Yes. <laughs> then the groom leaned toward the priest and hissed. He said, I thought we had a deal. And the priest put the hundred dollars he had given him back in his hand and whispered, she made me a better offer. Ah! <laughs> 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 
Anyway, whenever there's revival, even in a marriage, no, whenever there is revival, there's always reformation. See, revival isn't a bunch of hoopla. You know, sometimes we just, I think, is leaning toward charismaticness. We just see this like spirit end of things and oh, it was such a revival. No, true revival is going to equal reformation. There's going to be change. Revival always creates change. And, and I, I was brought to remembrance of something that Paul talked about, or maybe it's Peter, when he said that let judgment start in the house of God. Yeah. Amen. That's where I believe revival really begins. When we, are, as church people, will get back to sermons about the bad place of hell. Amen. You know, we just people today—they just want three points in a poem, and you know, just, just <laughs> tap me on my shoulder and tell me I'm special and I'm going to yes. be okay. Yes. And you know, but we don't want to talk about holiness. Amen. We don't want to talk about changing old ways that are not right that are disappointing and, and, and sinful before God. It's like, oh, you know, we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. But we don't mind hurting God's. Yeah. We don't mind that at all. Good word. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Always brings, always reformation. When Martin Luther put the reformation, there were changes. Revival is not just a a hoopla party with a tambourine and, you know, mm -hmm. throwing her notes up in there and running around the church building. Mm -hmm. It's personal repentance. Amen. Amen. It's a personal desire to go deeper and to come up higher in the things of the Lord. And certainly, he has done this. He, he's, Nehemiah, he's done everything that needs to be done. He has cleaned up and cleaned out everything there is. By the way, that's the only way our country will solve its problems. Amen. Is when the church. That's right. The church. I, I, I'll tell you, I got convicted over this myself today. See, we're, well, we're just shaking our head and they ought to do that. And they, what about us? What about us? Do we really understand that we are the change vehicle of the world? We're the world changers. Somewhere along the line, we've decided to go in a corner and suck our thumb with our Bibles and say, oh, they're after us, and, you know, they're just, we're just all going to be cursed again. Why don't we stand up? Amen. Yes. Really? Amen. And maybe not in so much judgment, but maybe more in our own personal judgment. Right? That's when revival's going to come. And I believe it is coming. Yeah. I believe Definitely. it's coming. I believe all that's going on right now, don't get discouraged by it. Get bold about it. Amen. Get infused with God about it. Yeah. Get before the Lord about it. Yes. Lord, what is it about me that is hindering you from using yes. me like yes. an Ananias? Yes. What is it that yes. is in my life that is stopping you from, from calling me Moses? or David, or the Apostle Paul. Listen, he's not a respecter of persons. He still needs to do the things today that he did back then. In fact, the prophet said, we've heard of your deeds in the past. Renew them in our day. Yes. You know who's going to renew them? <clears throat> when people step up mm -hmm. and say, here I am, send me. Yes. Isaiah saw the, 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 the amazing throne room and the robe of, of his of the tales of his robe filling the temple. And when he saw the glory of God, you know what he did? He didn't say, look at all those bad people out there in, 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 those, in the nations. He went, woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Mm. Mm. That's the way our country mm. revival will come in. So he reminds them of their past in verse 26 and 28. <clears throat> Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? We know what he did. He had how many? Thousand concubines and 700 wives or some ridiculous thing. Um, yet among many nations, there was no king like him. 
<clears throat> who was beloved by his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Mm. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Amen. Should we? Should we, then, should, we then, should we then hear of her doing all this great evil, trespassing against our God by marrying pagan women, and one of the sons of Jodiah, son of Elisha, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Shabbat. Here's another one. Okay, we have a high priest again, marrying Sambal, another, another one of the ites, the other one of the enemies, the Heronite. Therefore, I drove him from me. Am I at verse 28? Yes. yes. His point is this. There was no man in Israel <coughs> wiser than Solomon. Amen. None. Yet his affiliation with the world and the multitude of heathen women and wives and concubines that he had caused his life to drift away from God. Sodom is one of the saddest stories in the Word of God. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't read up on it, please do. Do a little study on Sodom. It is one of the saddest stories Amen. in the Word of God. And the reason is because here is this man, so right to begin with, just like these people. You know, so right to begin with. You know, he, God told me he'd give him anything he wanted. All the riches, whatever. He asked for wisdom. That's what made him wise. It's because he asked for wisdom. But at the end of the day, it all became affiliation with the world. Mm -hmm. These women that were brought in and, and, and the, the, the pride of, of what he was doing and what he had and all this kind of thing. The saddest part in history is that he became the greatest drifter in all of the Bible. That's why we have the book of Ecclesiastes to this day. What's he say about all this? It's vanity, vanity. Amen. It's just, it don't do it, is what he's saying. I've already done it. It doesn't work. It's not worth it. It won't bring joy into your life. Amen. He was chasing the world instead of God. Mm. And Nehemiah is saying here, remember our history. Yes. Don't do that. So Nehemiah ends chapter 13. Well, I, I thought we were going to end on this high, real high note, right? Mm. Because we were going in such a good direction. Things looked like they were turning around in Jerusalem. And so he's contending and he's confronting about his passion for God. And then we read verses 29 through 31, which is where the book ends. Remember them. Oh, my God. Because they defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood from the Levites and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to a service, and to bring the wood offering and the first fruits at, at appropriate times, appointed times, Remember me, O oh God, for good. Again, I can't emphasize enough. It's not like, look at me. It's fortify, Lord. Now, yeah, what you've called me to do, what you've set my hands to do, fortify me in that. I'm pleased to say, I am pleased to say, that things did go well for Israel for many years following this very difficult chapter, chapter 13. Nehemiah affected and infected an entire generation with his radical obedience Amen. and his commitment to God. Yeah. You know, you don't have to even preach to anybody. If you, in this day and age we live in, if you just become radical and committed to God, you won't have to say you are. It'll be so obvious you are. No one will have to hear it. They'll say it. Amen. They will know it because it's in such opposition and upside down this to the world that we live in right now. Amen? Amen. So that's the book. <laughs> Nehemiah means comforter. He's a type of the Holy Spirit. And I mentioned last week that I want to hear from you a little bit. So I want to turn it over to some part of our service here today before we close on what stood out to you. What? And I don't mean just, you know, oh, that was a nice phrase or, I mean, what was there something that, that changed your walk when you went through this book? What, was it something in Nehemiah? Was it something that he did? Was it something um, that he, he was confrontal about? So I just want to give you an opportunity to tell me something. Say something. Good. Yeah. I think Steve got a mic for you. Here you go. Hello? He's going to turn the mic on. 
you will be all set. Okay. I think for me, because um, I was reading the book a lot outside of mm -hmm. uh, coming on Sundays. Yes. Um, and I, one of the things I thought about was the way the world is today and the way the world was back then. We are so consumed with things today. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the things that we had. Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking to myself, if they couldn't stay as faithful, how hard is it in this world to stay faithful to God? And you really have to stay in prayer and the word. And I think for me, looking at Ezra and Nehemiah and their faithfulness, because Nehemiah could have felt under the sword too. When you're one person against the whole world and you can stand up like that, that really says a lot about your character and Definitely. your your ability to know that God is surrounding you Amen. and that nothing will come against you. Amen. So for me, that's what I kept looking at with Nehemiah was his faithfulness standing alone. It's really easy to stand when you're with other people. Sure. But when you're by yourself, yes. you can just fall yes. by the wayside. Yes. I know with yes. myself, I say, God, I, things and things and things, and you know, we want things, more of this and more of that. And they didn't have anything that we have today. Yes. So if they were having a hard time of it, you know how people are in this world. So it's really important that we stand <clears throat> in God's word. Yes. Wow. And I want to add to that because it was one of my takeaway points. And we don't have to be alone. Right. You know, we have a community of other believers that can help you and pray for you. And so alone is the call of Tobiah. Right. You know, because he always likes to get us alone to discourage and to right. tell you how difficult it is and how hard it is. Right. right? Anyone else? Raise your hand up nice and high. Mr. Louise. Um. Chapter 6 was uh, very powerful for me. Chapter 6 was when the enemy came back after Nehemiah, and they said, why don't you come and meet with us? Yeah. And he had the wisdom to say, to say no, I'm, I'm busy doing God's work. Yeah. And they came back a second, and a third, and a fourth time. And he was persistent to follow God and follow the Spirit, and didn't meet with them. Then the enemy came with fear and they wrote a letter and then they wanted to pressure. We're going to tell the king that you're doing and yet he didn't allow fear to enter in. And then they came back one more time and then it was, uh, let's meet in the temple. That's a great place to meet. And he was persistent and he followed God and he was safe because of that. So I looked at that. How many times do we get pressured to do this? Or it's a good thing, but it's maybe not a God thing. Sure. And the pressure comes, and the pressure comes. And what do we do? We try to be people pleasers, and we give in, and then we end up getting hurt. So for me, it was listen to God, listen to the Spirit, and only do what the Spirit tells you to do. And you will be safe. So that's a very big point that I got out of that. Yeah. In fact, wasn't that the chapter when he said, how can we come down off the wall for this great work? Yes. Mm. Right? It wouldn't come, he wouldn't come down off of the wall. He didn't even come down on the ground in that conversation. He just kept going, right? Yeah. Someone else? Yeah. Yeah, I agree totally with uh, Pastor Louise concerning what you just said about the enemy. And I can equate that to... Uh, the threat of a second attack of COVID, instead of us receiving that, receive what the word of the Lord says Amen. in Psalm 91 verse 10. Yes. There shall no plague come near thy dwelling. Amen. So we need not receive the report of the enemy, but we're gonna believe God. Amen. And as Pastor Deb said, it's the church's turn. We're the ones who need to stand up yeah. and make those proclamations. Amen. Proclamations. Amen. 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 Yes. Amen, Brother Jeff. Um, amen and you on that. Somebody else. Lou. Yeah. I'm going to the, uh, we talked about being matched up as a husband and wife. Yeah. And in our family, our son was married to a Christian woman. He had a lot of problems, but yesterday he married a Christian woman. I read that. Thank God he's happy as wow. I've ever, ever wow, seen. Wow, 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 wow. And our daughter now is having a problem with her husband because he's not a Christian. And she is. And it's true. It's you can the facts. Right? I can test that. You can see it. And it's, it's hard to help someone that's not a Christian. And they're married. And now we're trying to 
We're probably trying to pray him in. And hopefully, God will take him in. It's going to pray for that. So. You know, it's funny. Um, one time, there was one time that I, I couldn't do a marriage because the person got saved at the premarital meeting and the other one didn't. Oh. Well, you honey, really good, you know, so. And they were mad at me. <laughs> but you know what's so interesting? Like, you know, when the Bible says about being unequally yoked, you know, that's only a picture of this of an oxen, mm -hmm. and it, it, that the hardware that goes and drives them together. If it's not done right, the work can't happen correctly. Right. There's somebody's going one way, somebody's going another way, and then nothing happens. Okay, there's no productivity. But even if two people are unbelievers, that's okay to marry. Mm -hmm. See, somewhere we get the mind, oh, you have to be a believer to get married. Well, no, I don't think so. Amen. Yeah. Two unbelievers, because they're on the same page. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's the unity God's looking for. Because he commands his blessing in that unity. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. Now, enough times it happens where you get married and then maybe someone gets saved oh. in that, but... Unequal, you know, again, I can't even emphasize enough like the dating for the mate part because yeah. women, especially, I don't, I can't speak for men, but women, oh, you know, I'm just lonely and I just am looking for something to do. Well, you just don't know when you're looking for something to do if you might fall in love with Mr. Something to do, right? That's right. Somebody else. I just want to piggyback on what you were saying with my last boyfriend that I had. We were both unbelievers and we were doing fine and then the Lord talked to me for the first time. And um, I went to church, my aunt took me to church and I became saved. And then I told him, we can't do this, 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 this and that until you get saved. So that didn't happen, but when, the, when we broke up, the Lord just blessed me with so much. So being um, unevenly yoked, I can attest to it because I thought the same thing. I can pray on men, I can do this, but no, it's all in Jesus' hands. Amen. 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 Okay. I can tell you to the book of Nehemiah, thank God. Older. <laughs> well, what I liked the best was the corporate worship that all the people had together. And I don't know about anybody else, but I have felt that since the congregation has come back together. Yes. That the yes. Spirit of the Lord is truly here. Yes. And He is our joy, and He inhabits our worship. Mm -hmm. That's so true. That is so, since we, since the two services became one, there has been. Definitely. If you, yes. if you were travailing with me through that, you know, there was just that first week, it was tangible. It was just like, wow, just so true. And, and the meaning of corporate worship through that, right? Like that's the purpose is to bring the presence of God together, arm in arm in fellowship, right? And wow, we bring him in here, all 50 of us at one time, and he's Amen. going to do something. Yeah. He's going to move in our lives, you know? Amen. Well, I also uh, was really impressed with um, chapter six and seven. And um, too many people are fearful today over many, many things. And then it stops the work of God in their lives. And so that's what I was feeling too, that um, a good takeaway, you know, for myself and then for me to share with others that fear will stop your destiny. Yes. You Amen. know, Tobiah and Sam Ballot, yes. that, they were there to stop the wall. And that was the destiny that Nehemiah had. And so we have to be mindful to recognize that different things come. Satan can come, just like an angel of light, and speak things. And all of a sudden, you you just put that in your spirit without really asking God. And so we have to keep our face like flint and move on towards that destiny in Christ. Because he has that work for us to do. Amen. Fear is a liar, Amen. just like the origin it comes from, mm -hmm. right? Amen. One more. Anyone? Go ahead, Steve. Um, yeah, one thing that struck me um, with this book is 
Nehemiah, I mean, he, he didn't lay back. He went after it. Mm. And, you know, he was not passive at all. And I think, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, in the world, you know, we want to attain um, a certain level in sports or in, work, in the workplace and things. You know, you go after it. But sometimes, as Christians, um, I know our experience has been, you know, sometimes you, you kind of lay back or you see people, you know, lay back and God's going to do it. And he's going to do his part, mm. but we got to do ours. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Good stuff. Yes. It was really, you know, was to, to see Nehemiah just do it like, like today. He's beating people up, pulling hair out. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, Are you suggesting we implement that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it gets a different time, but in a sense. Sure. But there's a really, you know, like, just to see that man, or, you know, the bylaws women too, I mean, just really giving it their all. Yeah. And it was really exciting right. to see that. So. Sold out. Yeah, yeah definitely. Sold, sold out. out. Yes. No, no bars held, yeah. right? Just yeah. sold out for God. Are we there? Gosh, we need to get there. Amen. Michelle, I think we need to play something tonight. For somebody. Oh, I did. Okay. Oh, I liked when you said we need to get on our knees and we need to be asking God Instead of saying, well, somebody's got to do it, somebody's got to do it, well, we've got to do it. Yeah. We've got to get on our knees and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Yes. And when we give ourselves completely to the Lord and be led by the Holy Spirit, you're, you're going to see revival. Because we're yes. going to be unified, yes. but we're going to be unified yes. in the Spirit. So true. Because you're right. It's like, well, somebody else will do it. But imagine... Imagine if our bodies, because Paul yeah. relates the church to our body. Imagine if, like, this leg said, yeah, I don't need to walk today. Because <laughs> the left one will do it. You know, we'd be walking around like this, right? Like, right? And that's what happens in the kingdom. We're hindered from the empowerment that God wants us to be infected and infusing this world with because some leg doesn't want to walk or don't, they don't feel like doing that today or the ear doesn't want to listen to the Lord or... Right? It, but if all the body parts are healthy and fortified and listening to their instruction, man, we would be an army you could not reckon with, right? Amen. Right? Amen. Let's take one Michelle, one more. Um, you know, the, in the beginning of the book where you went around the gates and just um, Nehemiah went back to assess the damage. Mm. And that part just always spoke to me because of coming out of an abusive mm. past. The assessing that God did on my heart, you know, like as I brought my heart before him. So I just see that healing process taking place in Nehemiah. And that's always spoke to me. Yeah. Mm. And to get rid of yeah. the, especially the dung gate, getting yes. rid yeah. of the thing. That, that was very important. Yes. You know, getting rid of your trash. Yes. And not that people are trash, but people can hurt us. Um, and we hurt people. Yes. And this is what we do. And, but God provided that dung gate to Amen. take that stuff from our soul realm and mm -hmm. get rid of it. Because if it stays there long enough, then we become sick with that, right? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely amazing. I, one of the things that stood out to me and it kind of encompasses everything you're saying is if we don't keep our spiritual life on the top agenda, things will always drift backwards. Amen. There's no just staying where you are. If you're not moving forward, trust me, you're moving backwards. Yes. So we have to keep our spiritual life on the top of our agenda. And you know how that happens? I, I, I say this to people all the time. I've experienced it myself. I know it to be true. Is that, well, you know, I tried that. You know, God doesn't want you trying something. Amen. You know what? You know what gets the victory? You know where the promises come into our life with diligence and consistency. Amen. Don't worry about it didn't come, it did come. You just do, and I just do, and we just do what we're supposed to do yes. in a constant manner. Amen. And I'm telling you, Amen. God's promise is going to chase down yes. that consistency yes. and that yes. diligence. Amen. Because he's not a man that he would lie. Amen. All his promises are yes, yes. and amen. amen. But how true are we to really believing that? Or are we just amen. trying it? Mm. You know, faith is not something you try. That's right. Right. Faith tries us. 
Right. Amen. Amen. Just stand with me. I want to close out the book. Mr. Luis is going to be here next week. Um, I'm going to close out the book with um, just a song I've been, I've been kind of saving. I think we sang it once on Tuesday. I think it's just so apropos for today. We are all, remember, they were on that wall with their tools and their swords in their hands. That was another part that really got me. They weren't just up there, la, 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 well, you know, just wait till lunch comes. No, they were fighting the enemy, working for the Lord the whole time. And that battle and building, I think it was called that week, building and battling, that's the message to the Christian. So, you know what? I'm so thankful I get to build his church with you. And I hope you're happy as you look around to your neighbor and know we are building and battling to build his church. Let's sing this together and then we'll close out.